Now, I don't mean someone who just like steals something once in a while. I mean a thief. I mean the kind of person who no matter where he is or what he's doing, he's always looking around for something he might want to come back for later that he could maybe sell. It's an entire lifestyle. It's a way of being. It's a set of beliefs. It's a belief system. It's a belief system in which the person believes that if that could be uh, turned into cash for something I want, there's no reason on earth why I shouldn't go take it. And if I'm a smart thief, I'll find a way to take it without getting caught. If I'm a dumb thief, I won't get out the door with it. Anyway, Mike had been a thief in his most previous physical lifetime, and he said, he said something like, Bruce, you know what happens if you take a big nail, a big iron nail, and a huge magnet, and you just sort of stroke that iron nail with the magnet? You say, you know what happens if you do that for long enough? Well, I started out as a physics major in college. I know what happens. If you stroke that nail with that magnet for long enough, there comes a time when you can set the magnet down, and the nail is now magnetized, and it'll attract other iron things. Mike said, you know, my life as a thief was kind of like that. Excuse me. So my life was kind of like that. He said, uh, during my lifetime, as I lived the life of a thief, I was sort of stroking myself with a magnet called thief. A complete set of beliefs. And he said, after a while, I had become magnetized with thief. He said, when I died, there's this whole place called Thief's Hell that's a really strong magnet. But it only attracts things that are identical to it. And since he had magnetized himself as a thief when he died, he was attracted into the place. He said it was uh, a place just like this. He said it had rocks and trees and cars. He said it looked every bit as real as, as his physical lifetime. There were other people there. It took him a while to understand that, yeah, there were other people there, but it was a little bit different than Earth. Not that he understood it while he was in it. But he said, every man, woman, and child in that place was a thief. And he said, you know, when I landed there, I landed in the inner city. That's probably Focus 24. So I landed in the inner city, dense population. He said, I had to steal to eat. I had to steal to do anything. I had to find somebody else who had what I needed and steal it from him. He said, that was okay, I knew how to do that. He said, the part I didn't like so much was that as fast as I could steal it, it was being stolen from me. Because every man, woman, and child there is a thief. And no matter how much he stole, he never got ahead, because it was always stolen from him. Well, he lived in the inner city, he said, for quite a while, and he finally realized that this was getting to be kind of futile. No matter how much he stole, it was always stolen from him. He just barely scraping by because he wasn't that great a thief. And at some point, met a woman, and they uh, started a relationship and decided, let's move out of the city. Let's move out to the suburbs. Focus 25. A little less dense population of thieves. He said that was, a, that was an improvement. He said we weren't stolen from quite as often, didn't have to steal quite as often. He said, of course, we still stole from each other. <laughs> and they are thieves, right? But he said there was something going on between the two of us. He said, I didn't really understand what it was. But he said, eventually, we decided that, you know, the suburbs were even too packed. There's too many thieves around here. They're always stealing from us. <laughs> And so they decided to move out into the country. Focus 26, a little <coughs> less intense area of thief's hell. So in Focus 26, you know, there were um, a lot fewer people living there. It was much wider distribution of population. He said, I wasn't really stealing much at all anymore. And it wasn't being stolen from much at all. He said, in fact, I was actually starting to work for a living. <laughs> He was actually beginning to do things for himself, get things he needed by his own work instead of stealing it. And he said, one day, there's a knock at the door. When he opens the door, 
he recognizes immediately that the person standing in front of him is a master thief. And this guy is good. This guy is smooth. He is a master thief. But he said, the guy has run an innocent sucker on me. And all these hells, they have these games, they run on each other. Now, if you want to be a thief, you have to be creative, you know? You have to come up with some way to have a plan. Well, Innocent Sucker was a plan. It was a well-known game in Thieves' Hell. Innocent Sucker was a game in which someone would show up pretending to be a pretty novice thief, pretty bumbling thief. He would pretend to be someone who was inadvertently showing you the most precious thing he had stolen, the thing he valued most. He would, this innocent sucker game, you know, the guy would pretend to show him his most precious thing. But an innocent sucker, the way the game is run, the guy who's playing that game is really playing the bumbling thief <coughs> to put you in this kind of a false sense of security so that he can scope out what you have pick out the most precious thing you have. And then the game is that he steals your thing. He said, I recognize this right away. And so the guy was running an innocent sucker on me. He was a master thief. So I began to run counter innocent sucker on him. It's another game. Counter innocent sucker is when you pretend to be taken in by the innocent sucker routine. <laughs> Do your best to make the guy think that you're falling for it, but all the time you're scoping out the most precious thing he has. And then when he comes into your house to steal yours, you're standing there with his in your hand. <laughs> gotcha. Try to run innocent sucker on me, will you? So Mike said, that was my plan. So I started running counter innocent sucker. I played it up great. That guy never, he was never going to know what hit him until he walked into my place to take mine and I've got his most precious. He said he would never even know. I'm good enough to do that. And as the game progressed, it got to the point where it was time for Mike to go steal innocent sucker's most precious thing. And as he thought about doing it, he said, it all came back to him, how, just how futile it was to live this life where he always stole, because he knew no matter what he did, it'd be stolen from him. He decided he couldn't go through with it. And so when the innocent sucker came into his house that night to steal his most precious thing, Mike said, hey, you want my most precious thing? There it is right there. Take it. It's yours. Enjoy it. Next thing he knew, Mike said, it, it felt like somebody went and spit him out. And he found himself floating in this black place, unfamiliar to him. It was totally black. He couldn't see anything but blackness around him until something started to approach, kind of looked like a light. And as it got closer and closer, he realized the light he was seeing was the guy who just ran innocent sucker on him. It was a helper. In my experience, helpers are the only ones that have much of a shot of retrieving people out of the belief system territories. And Mike's helper explained to him what had happened. He explained that he had been sort of on the outside looking in, and he had been watching Mike as Mike sort of made the decision to be less and less involved with being a thief, which is kind of like, remind of like, removing that magnetism he had, that thief energy he had. And the helper said, Mike, he said, I, you know, I got to the point where I, I thought, you're ready to be offered a back door out of hell. That's what the helper called it, a back door out of hell. He explained to him he'd been in this hell and he explained to him how he'd been living. He, he knew the whole story behind Mike's life there. And he explained, that the back door out of hell was the point at which Mike realized that stealing this guy's most precious thing was futile. It was the point at which Mike gave up being a thief. It was the point at which he could just no longer live that way. It was when the last vestiges of thief magnetism, if you will, washed out of Mike. And because he no longer was an energetic match being pulled in, the place just spit him out. 
So the helper then explained that Mike had a number of choices he could make. He could choose to go back into his thief hell if he liked. That was a choice he could make. He said you could choose to incarnate again if you like. Now you might make some choices about who you want to be born into the family of and where you want to be. And, and you know, Mike, in your next lifetime, you might pick a new role model. You might magnetize yourself in a different way. You might not end up a thief in your next lifetime and you won't be drawn into that place. And one of Mike's other options was to go to a place that the helper came from, a place the helper worked. Now I use work loosely because the place this guy, this, this helper came from is a place where work's really not like you and I understand it. For you and I, or you and me, work is what we do to get the money to pay for the food we have to have to, to eat and to pay for the clothes we have to have to wear and to pay for the car we have to have to get to the job we have. I mean, work is what we have to do to survive in this reality. Well, in that reality, it's not the same thing. We'll talk more about Focus 27 in a little bit, but essentially anything you want is there. So it's not work in that regard. Anyway, this helper explained to Mike that the other choice he could make would be to come and work at a place called the Rehabilitation Center in Focus 27. The helper described that this was a place where others who had managed to get out of their hells, because there are lots of them, and there's Thief's Hell, some of you who read the second book know about Max's hell, a hell for sadistic shrinks. And his murderer hell. <laughs> uh, read the second book, Max is a real piece of work. <laughs> there's murderer's hell, there's swindler's hell, I mean, you name it, there's a hell like it. And the only people who are there are just that kind of person. But for the ones who managed to escape, the helper said, if you'd like, Mike, you could come to work at a place where what we do is learn to go back into these hells and offer others a back door out of hell. Well, Mike said he thought that'd be a good idea. He'd like to do that. He said the next thing that happened to him was really strange. He said suddenly it was like he had a cocoon around him, just this nice, fluffy, soft, loving feeling <coughs> surrounded him. He didn't understand exactly what was going on, but it felt like unconditional love, if Mike could have described back then what it was. And the helper explained that Mike still carried some of the energetics that could attract him into another hell. He had magnetized himself in other ways, maybe in other lifetimes. And so Mike was escorted to a place called the Review Center in Focus 27 starting to get a picture of this next place. The view center was a place where Mike sat down with uh, another helper. And that helper helped him sort of review some of his past lives or some of the experiences in his present life. Helped him understand how he had magnetized himself, so to speak, in ways that would attract him into the, some of these other places. And then he began to work with the helper had offered him the back door out of hell. Someone that Mike called his mentor. He went to work in the rehabilitation center. And Mike described that uh, his mentor first took him through many, many different hells, still insulated in this sort of cocoon of unconditional love energy because that served as an insulator, would keep him from being attracted. He said that they reviewed, they went through a number of these hells and he began to look at how these hells worked. You know, it might have been murderer's hell or rapist's hell or swindler's hell or whichever. He said he began to recognize a common pattern. That the people in those hells who sort of got better at whatever the hell was about, the thief who became a better thief who became a better thief who became a better thief, that what that was about was that for someone to become able to steal from more people and be stolen from by few, all he had to do was to let go of some level of unconditional love energy he was still hanging on to. So he could do progressively more despicable things to do to other people that he would have to do to become a better thief. He said, once he recognized that in each of these hells, 
he sort of saw it in every one of them. And he said in a very short time, he had worked off all the energetics that could have drawn him into those places, and then he was ready to begin to work. And he and his mentor would go into hells. Hells that his mentor knew all the games. He said sometimes they'd go back into thief's hell, because Mike knew the thief's hell games. And they would act as a team to run a game on somebody, offering them the back door out of hell. Mike said there was this curious thing that began to happen. That right at the point in the game in which the person he was running the game on was right at the point where he had been, where he had to go and steal the other guy's thing, that right at that point, he said something strange happened. He said at first, he could only describe it as something that came sort of through him and into the other person. And he said at first, he said it felt really good, but it was, it was almost painful. It, it almost hurt. It felt really good, he said. He said it felt like unconditional love, but he said it was so strong it, it almost hurt. And his mentor explained that what he was learning to do was deliver something they call boost. That at the moment this person is being faced with a situation in which they're ready to decide whether they're going to stay for a while longer or take the back door out. But he was delivering energy coming from somewhere and it was love energy and as he delivered to that person he began to recognize that that energy somehow brought clarity to the person's mind. It made it so they could think more clearly. It made it so that they could understand what was going on around them a little more clearly. He said at first there were, he said, pretty puny levels of boost, but he said they were still kind of painful. They were so strong to him. He said at some point, his mentor said, Mike, uh, I'm about to graduate. Won't be seeing you in a little bit because I'm leaving. Mike said, graduate? What do you mean graduate? And his mentor explained that he was at the point where he had learned what it is we humans are learning to the point that he was ready to graduate from the human school of learning. Well, Mike was very curious about what that meant and where this place was, and I was really curious about it. I said, hey, Mike, stop the story right here. Um, do you know where your mentor went? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I've visited there several times. I said, Mike, can you take me there? I wonder what this graduate thing's about. Mike said, sure, I can take you there. Mike said, just relax. Don't try to do anything in particular. Just relax. I'll move us there. What a trip. Shortly after Mike said that, I began to feel that. I began to feel bathed, saturated, permeated in an atmosphere of pure, unconditional, loving acceptance. Pure, unconditional love. Just floating in it. Just reveling in it. Just... I'm a child of the 60s, blissing out in it. <laughs> I'm not that much of a child of the 60s. And when I came back from that little trip with Mike, that's when I began to distinguish between what I call helpers and what I call angels. For me, angels are these folks who've graduated from helper school. Angels are people just like you and me in that they've had physical lifetimes before. But they've learned to experience and express unconditional love to such a high degree that there is nothing else they can do. Every act they commit is an act of pure, unconditional love. It doesn't matter what it looks like. I know that when you read in the paper about some mother whose child was on at death's door and the mother prayed the child be healed and then miracle of miracles, the doctors can't explain it, they don't know how it happened, but suddenly the kid is healed. I know what happened. I know that somebody in the land of angels, I call it, somebody up there heard that prayer. Somebody over there or down there, wherever the place is. It's just a shift of consciousness away. I know that one of the people there heard that prayer 
and they delivered a charge of boost so big and so powerful that nothing could stand in the way of it. No disease, no beliefs, nothing. And that child was healed. Well, as Mike began to explain this, I began to understand a little more. And Mike described how after his mentor left, he began to understand that when he was running a game on somebody in thief's hell or running a game on somebody in swindler's hell or running a game on somebody in one of these hells and when that moment came for that person to be able to have some clarity of mind to decide which way they were going to go that what he first felt is almost painful something going through him that that was boost that was love that was the, the energy of love and he came to understand that what he was really learning to do in that process as early on he had pretty easy marks he had pretty easy people to to retrieve it didn't take a very big blast of boost because that person was really close to making the decision already had some clarity of mind through their experience but as he continued to go into these hells and offer these back doors he got progressively more difficult clients you might say and it took more it took a greater charge, it took a larger amount of boost for that person to get the clarity of mind to realize what was going on and to come to a decision. He said once he understood that, he realized he was on the way to graduating. And once he understood that, it didn't matter that now the levels of boost he would describe delivering were thousands of times more powerful than the puny things he'd been doing in the beginning. It didn't matter that there was a point at which it was so strong it was painful. I mean, how do you describe bliss and pain in the same sentence? If you've experienced it, you know. And he'd get, he'd get used to delivering such huge charges of boost that it was getting to the point where he said to me, by the way, Bruce, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to graduate soon, too. Well, the belief system territory is in thieves' hell. And someplace called the Land of Angels. I think that's kind of on the boundary over here somewhere. We'll talk about that. And Focus 27. Another one of these innocuous, meaningless numbers. Focus 27. Focus 27 is this place where the rehabilitation center was. Focus 27 is the place where this review center was, is. They both are still there. Focus 27 is a place where the kind of people who live there, and again, the way that Monroe described and the way that I've explored, all these places are defined by the kind of people you meet there. In Focus 27, the kind of people you meet there are the kind of people who would never impose their will or their beliefs on another human being, on anyone, on any form of consciousness. It's just not in them. I mean, these are the kind of folks who have absolutely, I mean, they're on the way to having absolutely no judgment about what anybody does. If you ask, they're more than willing to help. But if you don't ask, they're not going to impose their will on you. For those of you who are... Um, who are interested in getting in touch with guides and, and think you have and are communicating with them in any way. One of the acid tests for whether it's worth continuing the relationship for me is if that person never imposes their will or beliefs on you, they're not the kind of folks I'd be interested in having as guides. Well, Focus 27 is this place where these people live. It's where helpers come from. It's where helpers live. It's a place where thoughts are things. It's a place where, for the life of me, I can't understand why women have so many pairs of shoes. Oh, and honey, you're in the audience. You don't have that many pairs of shoes, honest. But if you're the kind of person in a physical lifetime who really liked new shoes, who really liked the latest styles, in Focus 27, you could have a warehouse full of them in every color and every style you want. In styles that haven't even been invented yet, but will be. 
just by thinking, oh, I think I'd like, I think I'd like the pumps, but I want a strap here and I'd like them red. And they're there. Thoughts are things. For those of you who are smokers in the room, I think I'd like uh, three castles tobacco rolled in uh, rice paper with a filter, and I'd like it lit, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thoughts are things. If you can imagine it, you can create it. And if you cannot imagine it and want to, there are helpers who'll be happy to uh, show you some things you aren't able to imagine yet to help expand your awareness beyond where it is. Some of the other places in Focus 27. I mean, this Focus 27 is a place that's created by humans for humans. The territory, the police system territories are the same sort of thing. Those are created by humans for humans, but they're a little more restrictive. Focus 27 doesn't have those restrictions. There's a place in Focus 27 called the, Re the <coughs> Health and Rejuvenation Center. Sometimes when people die, they carry the habit of a disease or the habit of their cause of death into their afterlife experience. I mean, that's what I've found. You know, t don't take it from me. That's what I've found. For example, um, I was once taking a tour of this health and rejuvenation center and this patient was brought in, this man who had died as a result of a fire and a lot of his body had been horribly burned and he was in tremendous pain when he died and the only reason that he was retrieved out of Focus 23 was that the helpers who were there managed to get through to him and explain that they had a drug in this syringe that would be guaranteed to take away the last bit of pain he had and if he would just allow them to inject him that he wouldn't feel any more pain and he, he went for it and they gave him the shot pain went away and when he woke up he was on a table still under a sheet but he was in this health and rejuvenation center. Now he really still wasn't sure about whether he was dead or alive. I don't think he really knew he had died. But I watched as in the surgical amphitheater sort of environment where there are all these chairs like a surgical amphitheater, nice theater seats, and this table he'd been laid on with a sheet still over him and these people walking in, theater seats, and this table he'd been laid on with a sheet still over him and these people walking in sitting down in the, in the theater seats and the fellow dressed up as a doctor who walks over to the guy who's laying under the sheet and says uh, yeah, my name is doctor so-and-so and I'm you know, I'm here to treat you today and I want you to know that you have uh, some choices to make he said um, would you like to be healed scar free pain free not a hint of a scar on your body anywhere. Would you like that to be done instantly or would you like to take some time? Well, the guy had a belly bigger than mine. I mean, this is pretty big. I'm about three, maybe four months along. And you could see this guy's belly start to bounce under the sheet as he was laughing at how ridiculous it sounded to be healed instantly. He just thought ridiculous that he was laughing at it. And so he kind of in a laughing voice said, well, doc, instantly, of course. The doctor kind of said, very well, and he stepped back. And the room started to fill with love energy, with the feeling of love. And I don't mean the thinking about it. I mean, all of you can remember a time you were feeling love. And if you all just sat here for a moment and thought about that and remembered the feeling of it, that's how it started, remembering the feeling of love. And the room just got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger with it until finally I could see beams of this energy coming out of the chests of these people sitting up there going into the man under the sheet only lasted for a short time and when it all switched off the doctor walked over and with a big flourish you know took the sheet and kind of threw it into the air the next thing the guy knew he was standing buck naked in front of the doctor and the doctor's looking him over like hmm almost with a magnifying glass looking for any scar material which of course drew the guy's attention to his body and he's looking down thinking holy cow what happened? All the scars are gone. All the, all, the, all the burn stuff is gone. I've been healed instantly. And the doc said, well, that's what you asked for. What you agreed to. 
And at that point, a couple of other orderlies came in. I mean, helpers dressed like orderlies, and they escorted the guy out. And I knew what would happen after that. I knew that from that point on, they would introduce him to the fact that he had died, and he was now living in his afterlife. That's a place called the Health and Rejuvenation Center in Focus 27. There are lots of other places like that. And you can read about them in books. Or I can tell you more if you want. It's either way. But I do want to get on to something else. Because in this Focus 27 area, over here, if we put a line at the edge of it, the next one's Focus 28, right? According to Monroe, Focus 27 is the last area that you could define as human consciousness. On the other side of that line is consciousness that you would describe as non-human. Well, there's one particular area that, of that that I've explored some, and I'd like to spend a little time before we get off to questions and answers, or at least questions, who knows about the answers talking a little bit about what's this non-human consciousness stuff about. In Monroe's second book, Far Journeys, he talked about this area that he called the gathering. And he described that um, you, could, you could think of the gathering as if we have the earth here, this nice round spherical earth, but somewhere way out here there's another sort of spherical shell around the earth that defines an area of consciousness that he he called the gathering. Later on, came to describe as focus 34 slash 35. I'm not sure if he couldn't make up his mind or if it spread out a little. And then in this area, you'd find beings from other home worlds in our same physical universe. Aliens. We'd call them aliens. Although in your country, I'm an alien. I have to say this, if you came to my country, you guys would be Australians. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't take credit for that, but I sure like that one. <laughs> well, this, this place is a place where there are beings from other home worlds in our physical universe, there are beings from other universes, and there are beings from other dimensions, and they've all sort of gathered there to observe what we've come to call earth changes. <clears throat> Lots of reasons. I mean, one of the groups that I asked about it, they were essentially like a news crew. You know, they were out with the cameras, you know, film at 11, back to the studio. They were just there <laughs> gathering the news and sending it back to the home world, folks. And one of the groups that I, that I bumped into there was one that I came to call Second Gath Group. And I called them that because of the second group of beings I met at the gathering. So Second Gathering Group, Second Gath Group. The other reason I called them that is because it, ne it never occurred to me to ask them what they'd like to be called. Well, my first contact with these folks was really kind of unusual. How many have seen the movie Star Wars? Any of them? Good, so all of you know the little robot, the little robot about this big on wheels, walks around going <laughs> making those real weird high squeaky noises. That's how these guys talked. And it was only by uh, great choreography on the part of other parts of myself that I'd learned that language before I encountered them. But in my first encounters with these guys, the story that unfolded was that yeah, they were here to watch the earth changes. They were here to see what was going on. They were here to try to understand what these earth changes were, to understand what happened as a result of earth changes. And part of the reason they were doing that was they thought, well, if this ever happens on our home world, then we'll have some data by which to maybe understand. And I... Uh, listened to them and we, we chatted back and forth and it became apparent that they thought they had everything they needed to find out what the earth changes meant. 
And then when I asked when I asked them to describe what this earth changes meant, the images that I perceived and information that I got added up to a story in which you might say somewhere far, far away, sounds like Star Wars, huh? somewhere far, far away, there's a source of pure unconditional love energy. But it's big, it's a big source. I mean, we live in a solar system and our solar system is part of a galaxy. Well, the, the source of this energy is galaxy size and there's lots of it there. There's so much of it there that it sort of sends beams of energy out through space. And it just so happens that our solar system has been moving kind of into the outer fringes of this beam for quite some time. And that means that this unconditional love energy is beginning to flow into our reality. Well, that was what that was what I got when I asked them about it. But when I asked them, well, what's the emotional impact on human beings? What, what's what's going to happen as far as emotional impact goes? And the spokesman's face went totally blank. And he couldn't do his <coughs> kind of communication because he had absolutely no word for emotional. He had to mouth back no. hit a mouth back the sound I made because there was no word in his language for emotional. In fact, as I began to communicate more with these guys, I realized it wasn't just he had no word for emotional. Emotional wasn't even part. It, it, there was no emotional understanding whatsoever. That this race of beings it wasn't just that they didn't know what it meant. They had no idea it existed, whatever it was. And when I suggested to them that all this fine equipment they had, because they had a ship bigger than this room and it was full of, I mean, my perception bigger than this room and my perception like a NASA moonshot. I mean, there's, it looks like monitors and computers and all kinds of recording equipment stuff. When I told them that, well, you know, gee, this, um, this equipment looks very good, you know, it looks, looks really, really nice, but if you guys want to know anything about the emotional impact of unconditional love energy on human beings, I'm afraid your equipment, I'm afraid your equipment's going to be worthless. The next sound I wish I could make because it sounded so good, so you'll have to imagine it. You guys have turkeys in Australia? You know the kind of sound they make? Imagine a thousand turkeys screaming that sound at the top of their lungs inside a huge tin can. <laughs> it just broke out with this squeak. Well, that was really the first point at which I began to understand anything about their way of being. Second Gather Group is a telepathic race. And their, their chosen path and the evolution of consciousness is different than ours. Second Gather Group is a group, they're telepathic. I understood at first that that just meant that sort of like every one of them knew what all the rest of them were thinking. That's how I understood telepathic. That somehow they were open to the thoughts of every other one of their race. I understood that's what telepathic meant. And I remember telling the spokesman, you know, this whole idea of This whole idea of, of having the thoughts of every other member of my race running through my mind, if that was happening to me, there'd be so much stuff going through my head that my thoughts would sound like <laughs> just be noise. I wouldn't be able to think in all that racket. I said, the way you people live is totally incomprehensible to me. How can you live as a telepathic race? It makes no sense. To which the spokesman replied, well, you know, Bruce, you humans seem to have chosen a different evolutionary route. You seem to have chosen a route in which you perceive yourself to be completely individual beings. You perceive yourself to be an isolated, self-aware being. 
You perceive yourself to not be connected to other members of your race. You perceive yourself to be kind of walking through life alone. He said, let me tell you, Bruce, you human beings and the way you live your lives, totally incomprehensible to us. Well, after I told them that their equipment was all fine, but probably not to the job, and after they got through, after the sound of 10,000 turkeys in a tin can went down, <laughs> I said to them, if you guys want to know anything about the emotional impact of unconditional love, there's only one way I know to do it. You are going to have to become the censor. You are going to have to experience it. Because I don't think your equipment's going to get anything. And indeed, we started in this little series of experiments on a trip back to visit these guys. Um, the spokesman said, you know, say, uh, we really do want to know about this unconditional love thing. We want to, we want to know about this emotional impact thing because it seems to be part of your earth changes. And, you know, geez, if it happens to us, we're going to want to know how to deal with it. So um, we'd like a demonstration, please. And when he said that, I could see that a platform in front of me, about where the table was, raised up from the rest of the ship, had two of their rays standing on it. And he said, you know, we understand that as explorers, and that's really what they are, we really understand that as explorers, oftentimes the greatest discoveries are made when we're confronted with something totally unknown. And that if we can explore into that unknown, we know from experience that that's where explorers should be headed because that's where we're going to get the biggest payoff. He said, he didn't say it this way, but essentially, these two standing here on the platform had volunteered to be the censors. They had volunteered to experience unconditional love. They had volunteered to experience whatever it meant to have the emotional impact of that even though, as far as they knew, it could kill them. He said, you know, we're, we're explorers. We understand that happens occasionally. And so, in several experiments, friends of mine and I, other physical friends, non-physically stepped into the bodies of these aliens. I stepped into the one I perceived to be the man, and Robin stepped into the one I, we perceived to be the woman. It was hard to tell. I mean. I know what a human woman looks like. <laughs> I can tell which is which. Anyway, what we did was to step into their bodies and then look into each other's eyes. And, you know, for a guy with a good looking woman, it's pretty easy to begin to feel love. It's often confused with the feelings of sex. And as we did that, as we allowed that unconditional love energy to build between us, I happened to look over in the ship to see what the other guys are doing. And they're passed out. They're clicked out. There isn't one of them conscious. And these great big heads of theirs are, are like back in the chair so far that they're gone. They're, they're clicked out. And we, the first time we did it was for maybe three or four seconds. And when we stepped out, we were still feeling pretty strong connection when we stepped out. And those guys came back awake like, wham! I mean, if they had necks like we do, I'm sure we threw some of them out of joint. And they looked at their instruments, and the spokesman came back and said, this is very odd. Our ship's clock shows that about three or four seconds of your time has gone by, but nothing registered on our instruments. In fact, nobody in the crew has any memory of what happened during that missing time. And so we continued these experiments, and eventually, my friend and I were able to hold that feeling, to allow that feeling of unconditional love to build for about a minute and a half or so to the point where I was no longer an individual and neither was she. We were just joined into some ball of light that was just loving itself is the only way I could describe it. It was, it was intense and it was very pleasurable. And we just sort of went on for about a minute and a half until we were looking around the ship and I could see the few of the crew members had gotten up and they were walking around. Some of them were conscious. 
with these uh, grins on their faces. They must have mouths because they were grinning. And Robin and I just sort of let that feeling begin to gradually slow down until that feeling of unconditional love energy was just kind of like a flickering candle flame, just barely there, and then we stepped out. And when we stepped out, the rest of the crew regained consciousness, and I could feel that the ones who had become conscious during the experience knew what unconditional love feels like because in the next few seconds you could feel it just wash through the entire crew every one of them just bathing in that unconditional love energy and in the next few seconds you could feel this yearning of wanting to feel it again well there were more of those experiments carried out and I'd like to share with you my my last my most recent experience with second gath group last September I contacted these guys again and and when I contacted them I was in a program at the Institute again and as I was headed off toward focus 34 34 35 again I noticed that my mother who's deceased was over here kind of behind me and my grandmother her mother is deceased is behind me over here and I'm wondering what are they doing here and we're kind of cooking along off toward gathering and we arrive and there's the spokesman and I was really happy to see him and even happier when he said Bruce he said um, how would you like to enter into our form of awareness how would you like to experience what telepathic means huh yeah, yeah, I do. I'd like to do that. He said, okay. He said, there's only one condition. He said, um, as, you're, as you're experiencing this, he said, um, I want you to remember not to start thinking in human terms. Well, I gladly agreed. Fine, fine. He did something. And then he said, Bruce, shift your eyes to the right. And I kind of went like that and realized that I was looking out through the eyes of a member of his race. And that member of his race could have been over by the wall.